In this video, we're going to talk about the basics of anticoagulation for residents and medical students. This is going to be everything that you need to know to succeed on your wards rotations. And I'm also going to tell you how to choose between the various different anticoagulants that are available. So let's get started. The first thing that you need to note is that there are two kinds of anticoagulation goals. So first of all, you have a prophylactic anticoagulation. And then secondly, you have therapeutic anticoagulation or full dose anticoagulation is what I would kind of call this. The reason I'm going over this is because this is a topic that is very simple, but I did not understand, uh, you know, actually when I was beginning as an intern, and I actually didn't know the difference between prophylactic and therapeutic anticoagulation. So prophylactic is obviously, as it's stated in the name, you're trying to prevent a blood clot. And therapeutic, you are, uh, are treating a known blood clot already. It's very useful to go over the different regimens that you have available. So what do you have for prophylactic uh, anticoagulation. So one of the most common ones that you'll probably see is going to be Lovenox or Anoxaparin, 40 milligrams daily. Uh, you may also see uh, Lovenox, 30 milligrams if they have an AKI. So this is a reduced dose uh, for their renal clearance. Um, another option is going to be heparin, 5,000 units, Q8 hours or Q12 hours um, if you think the patient is a high bleeding risk. And then for obese patients, uh, what we typically do is going to be Lovenox 0.5 milligrams per kilogram uh, daily. So if a patient is 120 kilograms, they're going to get a 60 milligram dose of Lovenox, for example. If they're also obese, then um, you can do heparin. And what we do at my institution is usually 7,500 7, units Q8 hours. So this, these are for obese patients. And so how do you go about choosing this? I would say number one, we're always going to choose Lovenox 40 for a majority of patients. Um, but heparin or Lovenox 30 milligrams, really we're going to reserve that for patients with AKI, for example, because uh, heparin um, does not get really uh, metabolized by the kidneys. It's not going to get affected by it. And so, you know, I prefer to do the Lovenox because it's just one once a day injection for the patients rather than three times a day injection like heparin is. So it's just a little bit more um, pleasant for the patients rather than getting poked so many times. So how do you decide whether a patient needs DVT prophylaxis in the hospital? Uh, I will say as a medicine resident or on the medical service, like 99% of your patients are all going to need DVT prophylaxis. Um, really, it's only going to be those very extremely ambulatory patients that are not going to need uh, DVT prophylaxis. But just being in the hospital itself is a pretty big risk factor for developing DVTs, especially in our older patients, because they definitely are not as mobile as normal. And so they have an increased risk. Uh, so I would say most patients should get DVT prophylaxis. But if you are, you know, wanting to actually calculate something to see if they need it, there is a PADWA score uh, for uh, DVT prophylaxis that you can also check as well. Oh yeah, and I forgot to add in that uh, sequential compression devices are something else that we use for DVT prophylaxis. You may also see them referred to as IPCs or intermittent pneumatic compression. Um, these are basically things that they place on the legs of the patient and they just intermittently squeeze or kind of massage their legs to try and prevent DVTs. Uh, the evidence for them is not super great, um, but it is more than nothing, right? And if a patient, uh, particularly if they can't get uh, DVT prophylaxis because they are um, you know, at risk of bleeding, then giving an SCD is at least some kind of uh, mechanical prophylaxis for DVTs. All right, next let's talk about therapeutic anticoagulation. And this is gonna be uh, basically a patient has a known DVT or PE, and now we need to treat it with full anticoagulation. Or they have AFib, for example, they need to be fully anticoagulated for that. So um, therapeutic, uh, kind of what are our regimens for that? So um, a big one that you're gonna see is gonna be a Pixaban. That's gonna be five milligrams BID. Uh, you're gonna see Rivaroxaban, and that's gonna be 20 milligrams daily. You can see uh, Dabigatran, 150 milligrams BID, and this kind of really varies based on your uh, formulary, and so this is very popular at Kaiser, but at my institution at UC Davis, we don't really use this that much. Uh, and then you've got things like uh, heparin drip, and uh, you're gonna have uh, Lovenox uh, can go here as well. Uh, but the dosing range for Lovenox is gonna be different than the you know straight up 40 milligrams over here. So um, over on this side, you're gonna see that the dosing for Lovenox is gonna be one milligram per kilogram BID. And these are dosing regimens that are just gonna be, you're gonna have like memorized after a while, uh, or uh, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram daily. 
but uh, usually you want to go for this one milligram per kilogram BID dose because there's less risk of bleeding and also it's better at preventing clots. A couple of caveats here is that for uh, apixaban, you actually have renal dosing. So uh, if your patient meets one of these three criteria, uh, age greater than 80, weight less than 60 kilograms, or creatinine greater than 1.5, then you actually do 2.5 milligrams BID dosing uh, for the decreased renal clearance that they're gonna have. And the other part I wanna mention is that if somebody has a newly diagnosed uh, DVT or PE, you actually start them on kind of a loading dose of apixaban beforehand. So uh, this is going to be uh, 10 milligrams BID for seven days if new DVT or PE, and this is the loading dose. For river roxaban, the thing to know about this is you need to take it with food. Uh, the absorption is not as good. And also, they have a loading dose as well if you have a new diagnosed DVT or PE, and that's going to be 15 milligrams BID times 21 days. Dabigatran does not really have a loading dose necessarily, um, but they do recommend you do uh, five days of IV uh, anticoagulation before you start the dabigatran. And then for the heparin drip, uh, one thing I like to ask learners is what is the advantage of using a heparin drip compared to all of these other things? Why do we often use heparin drip in the hospital? And the advantage is that it is fast on and fast off. So basically when you turn it on, the patient becomes anticoagulated very quickly. But if they start bleeding or something or they have a procedure coming up, you can immediately stop it and their anticoagulation will basically be gone you know, within a few hours as well. So that's one of the key advantages of a heparin drip. Oh yeah, and I just realized uh, one thing I forgot to put here um, on my prior lectures is that uh, obviously we have warfarin here or Coumadin. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is a vitamin K antagonist. Uh, what, what I'd like to say about this is usually you shouldn't try not to start people on warfarin. Um, it requires frequent lab monitoring. Um, and also you need to achieve like an INR goal of around two to three. And then frequent lab monitoring, uh, it's just like it has so many drug-drug interactions. Even if they change their diet slightly and they get more vitamin K in their diet from spinach or like vegetables or something, it's going to mess up their INR. So um, ideally, try to avoid warfarin um, if possible. All right, one quick point that I wanted to touch upon, um, but this is basically how do you really choose between apixaban or Eliquis and rivaroxaban or Xarelto? This is a very common situation that comes up in the hospital, I think, with new learners. They're like, why do we choose one DOAC over the other? And typically, you'll see that I think apixaban is really kind of the favored one, especially among cardiologists and a lot of people. Like, I personally prefer apixaban as well. And let me just show you kind of why that reasoning is. So if you imagine, uh, you know, the big difference here is what? It's basically the dosing regimen. So apixaban is twice a day, whereas rivaroxaban is only once a day. So if I were to draw, I really like to draw these graphs for people who are learning this or who I'm teaching. So if I am going to uh, graph, you know, their anticoagulation over time in both of these. So say the top graph is apixaban and the bottom graph is Xarelto or Rivaroxaban. With the twice daily dosing, um, you're kind of gonna get an anticoagulation level with a little peak at the beginning, and it's gonna level off, and then you get the second dose later in the day, and so you kind of get this kind of a look for your anticoagulation curve. Whereas for Rivaroxaban, instead it's only a one time a day dose, and so what you really get is this big spike early on, and then it kind of levels down, and then kind of just decreases throughout the day. So what are the implications of this? Well, for Pixaban, you just have so much more of a steady level of anticoagulation. So what are the benefits of that? You're going to have less thrombosis. You're going to have less bleeding because there's no huge spike. And uh, I mean, those are the main two things that we worry about, right? Less thrombosis and less bleeding. That sounds great. That's why, you know, most patients should probably be on a Pixaban. But rivaroxaban, you know, we do use this in some patients. And uh, why is that? So look at this. You have a huge spike right there. And then you have a lower level of anticoagulation throughout the day. So the kind of uh, consequences of that 
Are you gonna have increased risk for thrombosis? Because remember, you have this whole period throughout the day where you're less anticoagulated than the apixaban group. You have increased bleeding because you have this huge spike right in the early uh, beginning of the day. But then the question is, why would we ever give rivaroxaban to anybody? And uh, the answer to this is going to be, um, it's, it's easier, uh, easier t to adhere to. So imagine for your patients who have difficulty tolerating uh, many medications, they're non-compliant for some reason, or they just, you know, have some other issues where it'd be more difficult for them to take a twice a day medication. Rivaroxaban is clearly going to be the better choice here because the simplicity of a once a day medication may outweigh the risks of, you know, this increased thrombosis and increased bleeding because at least they'll be taking the medication rather than with the Pixaban where they might be missing doses and like stopping it altogether or doing something like that. So if anybody has an adherence or compliance issue, then Rivaroxaban is one that you really want to consider in that situation. All right, and that's going to end this video on anticoagulation basics and how to choose an anticoagulant. In the next video, we're going to be talking about DVT and PE. So if you want to look here uh, or here, I'm not sure where I'm going to put it, but I'm going to put a video here so we can talk about DVT, PE, diagnosis, and treatment, and how to really put into practice all of this information that um, we went over today in this video. So I'll see you in that video. Thanks again for watching and peace.